the Mac Observer's Mac Geek at episode 757 for Monday, April 15th, 2019. <laughs> And welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Cab, the show where we take all your questions, all your tips, all your cool stuff found. We mix it with our tips, our cool stuff found. Sometimes we throw a rant in there, maybe a tangent, a fish shake, something, anything, whatever it takes so that each and every one of us learns at least five new things every single time we get together. Sponsors for this episode include Malwarebytes at Malwarebytes.com slash Mac. We'll talk about why you want to go there in a little bit. But for now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Fearful, Connecticut, getting ready for tax day because we all love paying our taxes. This is John F. Ron. Well, actually, by the time people listen, it will either already be or have been tax day. So there you go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, yeah. It's, uh, you know, tax day is one of those things. It's like it's uh, of course, it's never enjoyable if you have to spend money. Um it's if you wind up getting a, a refund, then it meant all you did was overspend money. But, uh, you know, we're fortunate if we're able to if we have taxes to pay, it means we earn some money and that's not a bad thing. Uh, mm-hmm. So charmed life. It's a, a big part of the charmed life is perspective, I think. <laughs> so uh, that's how I that's how I get through my days. Uh, let's see. Let's go to we had a question on Twitter from listener michael actually there you know there's a lot to talk about today and we'll we'll get into some of it i I guess the first thing i should mention is we're on a new mixer here the mackie onyx 1220 firewire mixer that we had since august of 2005 finally decided to fully die it has been slowly dying for a little while uh, but the other day and i knew this and i in fact even said to someone who has a who has one of those? I said I might need to borrow your mixer if if mine dies before I figure out what I want to replace it with, and uh, and I said it's it's um it's giving me signs of Dave you should replace me soon otherwise you'll regret it, and and on Thursday afternoon uh, Lisa was up here in the studio doing some work and she said I don't think there's any sound I can't get sound to come out of the speakers and it was like yeah. I know exactly what's going on. So I got online. I found the uh, uh, Behringer. Well, what's the model? I can't even remember what the model. Is. Oh, it's the uh, the UFX 1204, which is essentially a drop in replacement for this Onyx 1220. It's a fully Firewire mixer. And I like Firewire for audio better than USB because Firewire is natively isochronous, which means that data is sent at regular time intervals. And with real-time audio, that's sort of an important thing. Um, USB is supposed to be able to be isochronous, but uh, my experience is that it's not. So, uh, isochronous th- and not synchronous. Isochronous. Hmm. I s o c h r o n o u s. That's right. Yes. Is that kind of like synchronous? Uh, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure what isynchronous would be, but the word is isochronous when you're talking about technology, right? Yeah, I don't. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hmm. yeah. I mean, it's it sounds similar to isynchronous. I don't know if isynchronous is a word, let alone what it would depict or or describe. But um, but yeah, so isochronous audio, right? Is their isochronous connections mean that things are happening at a at a regular time interval, and bandwidth is dedicated to that. Which is which was, you know, one of the core components of Firewire. That's why it's so great for was so great is so great for drives and things like that. And USB is is just sort of like whoever yells the loudest gets some space and everybody else sort of has to wait. And it's sort of a mess. Um, I mean, USB works great for a lot of things. Just audio ain't one of them, Um, even though that's what most of us wind up having to use for audio. And it can be okay, but it. Like Firewire's better. Anyway, so this it may well be the last Firewire mixer I get because there's not many of them on the market. I'm very fortunate that Behringer decided to effectively clone what Mackie used to do. Mackie doesn't make one of these anymore. 
Uh, so you may notice it sounds different because, well, it's a drop in replacement functionally. Of course, you know, it shows up zeroed out. And I decided not to just try and uh, copy the exact gain settings and EQ settings from the old one. I decided that's a, as good an opportunity as any to start from scratch. And uh, so I think we're I, I like the sound we have. Of course, I got to listen back to this episode and. We'll make some tweaks and all of that, but hopefully it sounds all right. We always like to hear from you folks too. feedback at MacGeekGab.com is, uh, you know, as good a, as you know, that, place that as any. board you have, that board you have is great because I heard you crystal clear saying feedback at MacGeekGab.com. See, so like nowadays, like our longstanding problem is solved. It's feedback at MacGeekGab.com. Yeah. But it was weird. Like the, I think what died in this in this old one is the firewire card. It was an add on card. And anytime I sent audio that would hit like zero DB on the meters, like, you know, not, not overdriving it, but, but hitting, you know, the, like a loud enough signal, I could watch the meters start to like flicker in and out, but it was only if I sent it via firewire. If I, it, like if I ran just, you know, raw audio through the board and did that, the board was totally fine. But with Firewire audio, like I could, I could literally watch it while we were doing the show and I could hear it too. It would like artificially compress in my ears. You folks weren't hearing it. Otherwise, you know, that, that would have been a no go, but it was obvious that this thing was, you know, on its way out. So thankfully I was able to make a split second decision on Thursday afternoon. It arrived Saturday. We're recording Sunday. All is good. So yeah, let us know what you think. That'd be good. All right. Now, um, we're good on that. We can go to Michael now, John. Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, Michael wrote us actually on Twitter at, uh, at Mac geek. He says a question for you guys. My neighbor has a 15 inch MacBook pro 2016 and she has a 27 inch Apple cinema display that she wants to hook up to it but needs some sort of adapter to do so that allows the power, the Thunderbolt and the USB to all be connected. Uh, so I'm assuming it's the, the three way cinema display connector that has those three things you just described. Um, there were a couple different models that Apple all called cinema display, but I think this is the right one. And I think all that's needed is mini display port. Um, so it, that is, looks like a uh, Thunderbolt 2 port, right? Well, better to say Thunderbolt 2 and Thunderbolt 1 used mini display port for Thunderbolt, but it in this scenario it is uh, mini display port. So, uh you that MacBook Pro that you described the 15 inch 2016 has two or maybe four uh Thunderbolt capable USB-C ports, which means that you need a USB-C to mini display port adapter and they're available in a variety of formats, including something like, you know, the OWC Thunderbolt three dock has, has one of those on there. And uh, Dave Ginsburg in our chat room at Mac slash stream says the Thunderbolt two to Thunderbolt three adapter um, will also work. And I believe that comes from Apple if I'm not mistaken. So um yeah, it, it, like it sh this should be relatively doable. Really, the question is, uh, what other cap while you're doing this, are there any other capabilities that you would want? And does it make sense to justify the purchase of like, you know, the, the OWC Thunderbolt 3 dock or do you just need the adapter? And it is from Apple and I'll put a link to it in the show notes. So thanks, Dave Ginsburg. Thoughts on that, Mr. Braun? Yeah, I kind of got a Franken connector, uh, at least on my Mac mini here. So one display I got plugged in HDMI, um, and then the other I have um, the mini display port to HDMI adapter, and then I have an HDMI to DVI adapter going to the other display. Okay. Because I don't think it has HDMI on it. It's a very old screen, but it does have DVI, which is good enough for me. Any thoughts about uh, what Mike's going through here? Um. When the time comes, I'll have to wrestle with that as well. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But, it, you know, it it's important to remember that Thunderbolt is is by design a very adaptable protocol. Like no, nothing 
other than other interfaces are Thunderbolt native, right? It, it, it Thunderbolt is like PCI in, you know, if you have slots in your computer, it's you buy something that goes into this slot that adapts you to, or adds some functionality. So yeah, that, that, that should work just fine. So uh, Dave says, I have the OWC doc and I still need that adapter. Uh, you may be right about that, but I thought the OWC dog had a mini display port on the back of it. I am looking at the OWC Thunderbolt three dock, or at least at their picture of it. Cause mine is downstairs, but, um, but it says it's got a, and I can see the picture of the mini display port right there on it. So that should work unless this display is actually transmitting something that is Thunderbolt data, in which case Dave Ginsburg in the chat room is absolutely right. So, um, so thank you for that, Dave. That's actually very helpful So, So there you go. And, and this is actually a, a great highlight, right? Just because the port shape is the same doesn't mean that it's passing the data you're expecting. So I think Dave's right. You need that adapter. Thank you. This is what I love about our chat room. When we get something wrong, we don't have to, you don't have to live a week with the wrong information. So here you go. And you yeah. can find that at MacGeekab.com slash stream. Thank you, Mr. Braun. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, you know, I'm going to share a tip from listener Barbara here because, um, because why wouldn't we? Uh, as, as soon as I find it here, why can't I find Barbara's tip? Oh, cause I'm not sorted alphabetically. That's my problem. She says everyone may already know this, but I was not aware. No, Barbara, it wasn't just you. Uh, thankfully I had set up my card correctly in contacts as well as in series preferences. She says, uh, in January I flew, uh, on a Delta plane from Charleston, South Carolina to San Antonio. As soon as I arrived, I, where I was staying in New Braunfels, Texas, I realized that I had left my iPad pro on the airplane. She says, I tried everything I could to contact the San Antonio airport to talk to a person about my iPad. Well, I am here to tell you that this was not going to happen. All you can do is fill out a form. I was frantic while preparing to drive back to the airport. My iPhone rang and that moment I knew they had found my iPad. The only way they knew how to contact me was because the people in the lost and found office knew how to ask Siri who owned the iPad. They told me how they found out who was to contact, and I was so thankful. Please know that I did not doubt that the iPad would be turned in. I just didn't want to be without it that particular night. She says, I certainly didn't remember how I had set it up. So she found an OS10Daily.com article that describes it, and we'll, of course, put that in the show notes. She says, uh, yeah, I, that, like, what a cool thing. I had no idea that you could do that with Siri. Thankfully, um, Barbara had, you know, set this up for herself, but it's it involves setting up your my contact record uh, in contacts, which is a good thing to do. And then uh, in Siri and uh, in the Siri settings, you can go down to my information and also do that with your your contact record. And uh, and then you can ask Siri whose iPhone is this or whose iPad is this? And boom, it will show that. That's pretty cool. I like it. I like it. I like it. Yeah, I already said that. Uh, or yeah. at least mine. Yeah, my information. It says John Efron. Because it knows who you are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. Um, did I put this in here? Yeah, okay. Uh Let's talk about a couple of these things that are happening this week. Uh, there's there's two things that I think are relevant to Mac Keycap listeners. So it wasn't just a bad week for technology in terms of, um, you know, my personal world and mixer here. Uh, it was a bad week in general. Dropbox, actually, they put this in place a month ago, but just started sending out the emails in the last couple of days. Dropbox now on their free plan has a three device limit, which means you can only install the Dropbox app on three devices per account. If your account is in free mode, 
this is not going to be enough for a lot of people. Um, if you have an iPad, a Mac and an iPhone, you're done. If you have an iPad, a Mac and an iPhone and another Mac, like say a laptop and a desktop or a home machine and a work machine, but you want to sync your Dropbox account to both of them, you can't do that anymore. Everything you currently have synced to Dropbox is grandfathered in. But when it comes time to say, replace your iPhone, you can't use the slot for your iPhone for your new iPhone. You have to get down to only two devices and then you can add your new iPhone back to Dropbox. This is not a good thing. And for a lot of us, it, you know, it, I mean, it, it, I think it's a hundred bucks a year that you would pay to, to uh, release this limit and also get up to, I think a terabyte of storage, right. On, on Dropbox. So it, if it's and for some of us, it may well be worth spending that hundred bucks a year. Uh, for a lot of people though, it's not going to be. And, uh, and that's not going to be overly fun. So, um, you know, I it would be being Synology users, John and I, I think, well, certainly for me, for my personal files, I sync everything with Synology Drive, which is private cloud, very much like hosting my own Dropbox-esque type of thing. But Dropbox is really handy for syncing with other people because it, you know, had become ubiquitous. Uh, through their, you know, referral program early on and this free offering that was very compelling and, and all that. Uh, so everybody has Dropbox. And if you don't, it's very easy to get it. And then you can, you know, have a folder that's shared amongst multiple people. But with a three device limit, like it currently works OK for me. But within six months, I guarantee that that's going to fall off. So I'm I'm looking for alternatives. It seems like Either Box.com or perhaps even more likely Microsoft's OneDrive. Box.com gives you 10 gigs free. OneDrive gives you five for sharing with other people. That's generally going to be enough. Somehow my Box.com account has 50 gigs free, which is sort of interesting, but uh, I don't, I'm not, I can't remember how I got there. But um, yeah, with Box, I remember the last time I looked at it, they had some limitation on the on the free plan regarding, I think, file sizes or something maybe they got rid they of do them. you're right i think the maximum file size on drop uh, sorry on box.com is 250 megabytes yes yeah and i was like well but that's uh, it seems awfully yeah. arbitrary yes <laughs> yeah yeah yep now the other thing i want to mention here and uh you know a few of us uh, including our friend dave noticed this uh, um if you go you may have old devices in your device list. So uh, Dropbox keeps track of this. Um, you may want to look at that just to clean things up. You may have, and I certainly did, and I think David did as well. Um, I had tons of old devices and, and they, it also geocodes it. So it was like, uh, yeah, you know, I got your iPhone 7 in Hop Hog, New York. The only reason I think they did that is because my ISP has a presence uh, over in New sure. York. Sure. Um, but I had like probably 15 entry device entries. So, um, so the way you get there, you may want to review it and clean it up. And, and I certainly did. It, I'm, I, to I'm, gonna let, I'm, I'm gonna let you finish this path, but folks don't clean it up yet. I, I have a caveat to add here, but, but go ahead. Okay. Well, I cleaned mine up, but the thing is, so, so through the web interface, if you click on your account and then you go to settings, then I think, is it in security? It is. That's right. And then security, and you're going to see uh, a whole bunch of things, but on the bottom of that list, you're going to see devices and it's going to show you all the devices that it is aware of um, for that account. And, um, and like I said, I had a whole bunch of old devices, which to me, it didn't, and, and also redundant entries, you know, like that were geocoded incorrectly. So I, I cleaned all of those up and everything seems to be still working, but please share your concern, my friend. Well, there, everything that you currently have in Dropbox on a free account is grandfathered. So having extra devices there is not currently an issue unless you need to add one. And then in order to add one, you have to get down to two or less in that list. So if you are going to add one, and if you know you only have three devices or less that you will want to add, 
then it's fine to remove things from that list. But you have to bear in mind, once you remove it from that list, you cannot put that device back. Now, it's entirely possible that you're talking about devices that haven't been used in years and years. Probably safe to remove them, but there's no reason to remove them. And you might risk having, you know, some old device or some device that's connected via one of these, you know, older paths that was grandfathered in and now cannot be re-added. So whatever you remove here, it cannot ever be re-added unless you have two devices or less in that list. So I wouldn't rush out to, to clean up this list unless you are certain that you only need three devices or less connected to Dropbox. Otherwise, there's just no benefit to editing this list. Just like there wasn't a benefit to editing this list a year ago, right? Mm -hmm. there, there was no reason to do it Maybe from a security standpoint, sure. If you know a device was was, to was taken or something, you can you know manage that here. But but in terms of just cleaning up the list, it comes with a potential cost now of not being able to reconnect that device if you happen to remove the wrong one. So, um, got it. Fortunately, I have exactly three devices in my list and don't anticipate needing any more. So what are I'm your What are your You have two Macs, an iPad, and an iPhone, right? Isn't that four? The iPad is not on the list. Got so it. I use the iPad. Okay. That often. Got it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 I mean, I've got several iPads that I use because, you know, some really old ones for like, you know, using on stage and things like that or, or with mixers. And um, yeah, this is, it's, it, it, I'm going to need to, I, I'm going to either need to pay for Dropbox or, or leave Dropbox. Um, and I'm, it, the the issue is that Dropbox is a very good for sharing, you know, with other people, but because of its ubiquity, it's also been baked into a lot of different sort of specialized apps. Like I've got, you know, one of my uh, mixer things will back up to like Dropbox only. Uh, that's the only path that the engineers, you know, chose to bake into this software. And I've got some other things like that, too. Uh, so I've got to sort of go through all of these things. And I know I'm going to miss one. Uh, I'm going to keep my Dropbox account. There's no reason not to. I think I've got up to 25 gigs or 22 gigs free in it because of all the referrals over the years or whatever. But um, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to need to rethink how much I currently rely on it um, and and maybe maybe change that. Uh, so anyway. It's just one of those things. It's uh, it makes sense from their business model. Like, you know, they used the free thing to gain that ubiquity. Now they have it. They're fairly well cemented in the market and they want customers that are paying the money. They don't want free customers. I mean, I, I, I get that. <laughs> I don't fault them for this, but it is um, it is just sort of a shame. It forces some change, uh, either a financial change or a procedural change. So. Yavol, anything else to add on that? It, 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 so, other services to use. Have you used OneDrive? OneDrive seems to be the one that everyone is recommending. Like by far, people are 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 pretty bullish on OneDrive. Uh, but Box is is sort of the other one that that comes up uh, pretty frequently. I like OneDrive, except then I actually just uh, cleaned up this problem here. As you recall. Um, it seems that OneDrive was causing uh, some sort of uh, minor corruption. That's right. Oh, well, that's I actually went right. through, and they actually have a support article. Um, and I went through the steps here, but it involved, um, you know, it got pretty geeky. I mean, uh, they're like, okay, you know, first quit all the, I think it was quit all the processes because it has some background processes. Then go into your keychain. And delete the keys, the OneDrive keys, and then open the OneDrive app package. And there's a script in there that resets it. And then I think I also deleted the uh, snapshots that were corrupted. Um, but yeah, now I don't get that silly error anymore. Um, oh, wow. Okay, yeah. If you can put that um, One, OneDrive support article in the, in the show notes, that would be great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. And that was a Mojave issue. Is that right? Um, I don't 
don't know if it was, I don't know if it was Mojave. Well, I'm running Mojave, but uh, I think it may have been Mojave slash APFS kind of issue. Okay. Okay. Huh. Huh. Yeah, I'll find that. Oh, yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It might just, it might not just be Mojave. It might be anything running APFS. That sounds more, um, sounds more familiar. So, okay. Well, I put a placeholder in the show notes for it. So to remind us to find that link. So cool. Well, not so cool, but you know, there we are. So, you know, we move forward together. Um, speaking of moving forward together, Robert sent in a note, but, uh, but he was certainly wasn't the only one. He says, Houston, we have a problem. The great app stringify that Dave put me onto through the show is shutting down. He says, I'm gutted about this as I cannot seem to find an alternative to replace it. That has the same range of device supported with the same level of control over them. Do you know of any worth a go? Uh, yeah, Rob, you're totally right. Um, so stringify is far and away the best of the smart home, uh, scripting but scripting is the wrong word because it's all done graphically with stringify but it's the the best of of those sort of automation services where you can tie everything together for example you know i i my favorite script to to mention is i have a you know ring floodlight cam which can detect motion and so i have that motion trigger a stringify flow that they call it or a script uh that turns on two of my hue bulbs and one of my life X bulbs, which are all in the driveway sets them to orange. Um, it, this script will only trigger if there's motion and if it's between the hours of 12 AM and 6 AM. So essentially the middle of the night, uh, it will turn them on orange. It will wait, I think five minutes, maybe 10 minutes, uh, whatever I've set it to, and then it will turn them off. So it's for really, it's for me, uh, if I'm here, I get home from a gig or whatever. I want the lights in the driveway to come on and stay on, but I don't want them to stay on all night. And so having this functionality is there. If everything you have is home kit, which ring is not, uh, but the other two things I mentioned are, but may not be depending on what bulbs you own. If everything were home kit, home kit could do this, but this is very much the limit of home kits sort of, you know, flexibility, this this is a this is there, but you will you will then after this you hit the walls. Whereas with Stringify, you can just like string things together, and it's this very graphical thing. You just sort of drop stuff in, and and you can see the flow of how things are going to go. It's like oh, okay, right, that makes sense, and you tie these together, and you know that sort of thing. Stringify was acquired by Comcast a couple of years ago, maybe a year ago, maybe more. And uh, now they announced you can no longer get the Stringify app in the app store. If you have it, you can still use it. But they've said that it will die sometime after June. They said it, it will it will be available until at least June is, is, I believe, how they communicated it. But it means we need to find something else. And so, you know, some folks have suggested using Homebridge, which is an open source thing it's an engine that you have to run on some device in your home it can be run on a mac uh it can be installed with with um with uh, homebrew if you want to do it that way or it can be installed on a raspberry pi or your disk station right anything that's just running all the time and what homebridge does is it solves that problem of say i have my ring uh, device but it's not homekit compatible well you put the ring plugin into homebridge and then homebridge advertises your ring device as a HomeKit compatible device and you can pretty much everything has a plugin for Homebridge. So you could do that and then you could do everything in HomeKit, but you're limited to what HomeKit can do. And that may or may not be a problem, but you are running this sort of, you know, geeky solution uh, depending on how you're running HomeKit. I found it to be, oh, sorry, HomeBridge. I found in my setup to be, I found the setup to be unstable. I was running it inside a Docker image on my Synology. I don't think Homebridge in and of itself was unstable, but I think, you know, just the setup of having to keep it running and all that was just, it was never entirely reliable. So there's other options. I haven't found a service like Home 
uh, like stringify yet, but there are people talking. Um, if you want to run your own thing, the smart things hub certainly seems to be the one that has the most flexibility. In fact, it might even have more flexibility than stringify. It has a language called web core that you can program. Um, it's fairly straightforward, but it, it, that really is a scripting language. Like you're going to do, be doing a little bit of coding. Um, it, it's simple coding, nothing overly complex, but, and, and certainly doable, uh, especially following examples online and, you know, tweaking from there as we always do. But yeah, it's not, um, like I said, it's not a good week for technology. You, you have a, a smart things hub that you just got. Have you messed with web core or anything yet, John? Not yet. And I looked at the, um, but it, it looks to have more options within the app to do smart things than the wink. Right. <clears throat> and I only tried to pair. The problem is, um, if you have a smart home hub like a wink Two or um smart things hub uh one thing that i found is i was like huh you know i wonder if i can have both environments talk to my smart iot you know smart devices and i think the answer is maybe <laughs> and then i tried to pair it with one thing so one thing i got is a wemo plug uh plugged into a humidifier which uh, actually i should put away but um I was able when I tried to set up a bulb with the smart things hub, it actually found the Wemo humidifier control. And I was able to use both environments to control that. But like I said, my bulbs, it, it, it seems um, it wants to be paired with either one or the other. I, it doesn't look like I can pair both of the hubs to a single device. Yeah, that that's I think that's that's right. You you're like low energy devices like the bulbs or whatever that aren't Wi-Fi generally can only be paired to one hub. The the only kind of sort of caveat there is if that hub, like, say, the Philips Hue hub is HomeKit compatible. Now you can like it. It feels like your bulbs are HomeKit bulbs. They are not right. They are paired to a thing that is HomeKit compatible, being the you know the the Philips Hue hub. But yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm curious what you think. We're 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 relying on you, John, to find our our path here and see if if WebCore with Smart Things is is the uh, is perhaps the the right path to go. And you said that smart things hub was, was only was less than a hundred bucks. Is that right? Yeah. It was like 60 bucks or something. That's great. Okay. Yeah. The wink, uh, the wink two is 99. So, uh, any of these hubs, um, you know, would be pretty affordable, but that was more affordable. I yeah. Be at least as capable. Oh, I think it's way more I, capable I, than the wink one. Because well, I don't think it supports quite as many. The wink two supports. I think it supports more protocols including some weird semi proprietary ones i mean they both support i think uh, uh z wave and uh what's the other one z uh, z link i think yeah so we're talking about this from two different angles and and you're totally right that the wink hub hardware wise supports more things but the smart things hub software wise is far more capable as a home automation controller and it, you don't have to have your devices paired with it in order for it to trigger them, right? If you've got something that has a web hook, uh, mm -hmm. smart things can control that, right? So it, let's say you have a, you know, you, you smart things could trigger off of your ring camera, even though your ring device doesn't actually pair on a hardware level with your smart things hub. Uh, but it can talk to that web hook and send data to it and receive data from it. And that's the beauty of this whole web core kind of thing. And, and you can do some of this in the smart things app too. I think web core is just far more flexible, but, uh, but yeah. Yeah. So from a software standpoint, having a smart things hub in your home, even if your hardware was all paired to wink, I would, it would be interesting to see, you might actually be able to get smart things to oh. control the wink devices, right? Because it becomes that. 
you know, that that hub, even though hardware wise, you're not connecting anything to it. There's there's two ways. And, and really, you need to look at them both in parallel, um, you, you know, from that standpoint. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm curious to see, but I like I would love to see if you could have it. So like if your doorbell rings, can you have it like flicker one of your lights in your in your house? that's not related to ring. No, but that's that's like the beauty of these kinds of things is taking these disparate tech, you know, the, the stuff from different hardware vendors and tying them together. And HomeKit does that, too. It just things have to be HomeKit compatible. Um in the uh, in the chat room here, someone asked, why not use Ift with its web hooks? Uh, because that's what Ift does as well. My issue with Ift is that it doesn't support parallel triggers. So, for example, I said, you know, if it's between midnight and 6 a.m. and there is this event in the in, you know, from this ring thing that happens to be aimed at the driveway. But if there's motion on, you know, ring camera number one. And it's between 12 a.m. and 6 a.m. Now go do a thing, then wait. Now go do another thing, right? So this this parallel triggers and cascading events was not something that Ift was built to do at its core. And I have never found a way to get Ift to do it. So um, so that's where that's where Ift falls apart for me. It's it I, I use it for several things. It it's great for exactly what it is. Ift is IFTTT and it stands for if this, then that. So it's a very straightforward thing. If one thing happens, then go do another thing. There is no, you know, cascading and, and parallelizing these sorts of things. However, the Amazon ALEXA device does have a lot of these features in it and also can be your smart home hub. And they very recently, I did not know this until I started digging in this week and somebody pointed it out to me, they added a weight trigger to this. So that's super handy. So that, that, you know, that allows for these, you know, more capable and more complex things. So, you know, there's, uh, there's hope out there. We're not the only ones that want to do this stuff. So, and, and we, and if you have the, you know, the Amazon a lady, you might, you might already have what you need. So we'll, the, the, the short version is I'm not making any radical changes in my home setup yet. I have a, at least a couple of months with Stringify still working because I was already using it, but I obviously will have to make a change on this one. Unlike Dropbox where I could just pay and, and, you know, solve the problem. I can't pay and solve this problem. It's literally going away. Uh, so we'll pick something, but we'll, we'll tell you, yeah. we'll, we'll let you know. Yeah. I should play with that. I started to try to, uh, yeah, so per your suggestion, I actually went to Ift and uh, because you were like, you don't quite understand what it is. And I'm like, yes, you're right. So I went and, you know, I created a, and I created my first script and uh, for a, a, a applet, I guess yeah. they call it. Yeah, right. Yeah. But it's a script. And, uh, and it works great. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> yeah. yeah, I see there's, there's, yeah, they, I, I think they actually do have a, a Wink module. They got a Smart Things module. Mm. They got a E Wave. Yeah. So I should, uh, Go to the next level and uh, make it control one of my uh, or do something with one of my devices. Yeah, there was something I was using with Stringify that Stringify didn't have a module for, but Stringify has an ift module. So I actually created these, you know, linked, you know, whatever recipes or whatever you want to call them. And, and it was like, OK, you know, Stringify will do its thing. The trigger happens and then we need to trigger a device that Stringify can't talk to. So go tell ift to do it and you're good to go. Yeah, it's crazy. But, you know, this is this is where it gets fun. Home automation is still very much the realm of the geeky with. And, and I'll say this with the exception of of HomeKit and and at some level, um, the Amazon a lady like it's a little that's still more geeky than than HomeKit just to, to set up. But it works fairly well. But again, you, you know, you kind of live within the the constraints of of that in order to have the simpler interface so yeah all right i have no idea where to go from here uh we have all kinds of things to talk about we have a lot of cool stuff found i feel like we should jump to that so i we will but uh the the first thing i want to do here is talk about our sponsor which is malwarebytes for mac malwarebytes for mac 
Uh, you can go to malwarebytes.com slash Mac, and that's where you can download this. It's available for free. Uh, you can scan your Mac for free. It's actually fantastic. I have, um, I have it set up here to scan my Macs, you know, at least once a week, because that way I know that I don't have any malware and it's super fast. Like it scans my entire Mac in like, they say that, you know, it scans the average Mac in under 30 seconds. I find that to be very, very true. And I feel like maybe they're, they're even sandbagging a little bit because I, I think it's like more like 15 seconds for mine. And I have a lot of files on my Mac. But it goes really fast and it will identify. And then, of course, if you have any, remove adware, un unwanted programs, viruses, ransomware, and really any other malware. And with the premium offering, you can have it remove all that stuff and detect it in real time with their advanced anti malware technology, catches all the dangerous threats automatically. So you're protected without even having to think about it. And your Mac keeps running silky smooth. You know, we we as Mac users are fortunate that not a ton of viruses and malware have been written for us over the years. But that's changing, you know, as Macs are getting more and more popular, there is more stuff to worry about. So running something that's not going to slow down your Mac to keep your Mac from getting slowed down from these other things is exactly what you want. And you can do that. So visit malwarebytes.com slash Mac. You can download it for free. And with that, you get a 14 day trial of their premium offering. Uh, so you can see what that's all about and kind of make your decisions from there. So go check it out. Malwarebytes.com slash Mac. It's free to download. You, you know, there you go. There's no credit card or anything. You just download it and you can run it and you can see what it's all about. And, and uh, yeah, but go do it. And our thanks to uh, Malwarebytes for Mac for sponsoring this episode. All right, John. Yeah, let's jump to do some of this cool stuff found. Then maybe we'll circle back around to a, another question here. Um, the first comes from show 756 and listener Mark, who uh, we were talking about. We asked for a geek challenge uh, about a car Bluetooth adapter. And he says, I've been using the Anchor Rove, R-O-A-V is Anchor's Rove brand spelling, uh, Smart Charge Car Kit F2. He says, I've seen it for under 30 bucks on Amazon. The device connects to your phone via Bluetooth and then plays through your car stereo using the FM radio. There's a companion app that lets you change the FM channel, find where you parked with GPS and monitor your car's battery voltage. He says, I used it. I use it to listen to music and podcasts in the car and also, of course, hands free calling. The Rove plugs into the 12 volt port on your car and has a microphone for making calls. Also has two USB ports on it, one of which is a high speed charging port to charge your devices. And it also supports playing of music off of a USB thumb drive and has a line in jack as well. Wow, this thing's got everything. It says my only complaint with the device is that it has no way to trigger Siri or voice controls to initiate the phone call or start music. There is an answer hang up button as well as a skip forward or back on the device. A very nice little add on for the price. He says, yeah, sounds like it. That's awesome. Uh, that would actually be something for you, Mr. Braun. All these things would, well, th th we have several to talk about here. Any yeah, thoughts? I know, so yep. I'm surprised all the stuff they crammed into that. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, Anchor's good at that, man. That's like their stock and trade. Uh, Greg hips us to another one um, that he says uh, what Brian need. Brian was the listener in the last show that had asked for advice on this. He says what he needs is a wired FM modulator. The modulator is inserted between the car's antenna and the radio's antenna in jack. The modulator has an aux in jack, and I think some may have Bluetooth built in, too. Since the modulator also has a switch that filters in the car antenna, resulting in static free connections, unlike a wireless FM transmitter. He says, I'm not handy, so I had mine professionally installed, but maybe we'll, Brian will have luck doing it himself. And he sent us a link to this. I, I had totally forgotten about this entire concept, but there is a standard jack on the back of your car radio for the car antenna to just plug into. And of course, it, of course, it's a standard jack. That way, if they ever have to replace the radio or whatever, they just unplug the antenna and plug it right back in. Very, very simple. And this device sits in line. You unplug the antenna from your car radio. 
you plug this device into your car and you plug the antenna back into this thing and it just sort of hijacks or can hijack that signal coming in. As he said, as soon as it kicks in, it filters out any signal coming from the antenna. So you're not getting interference, which is pretty cool. And I, I did one of these with a, I think I added a CD player to my car, like when I was in high school or something. And, uh, and I used one of these because it, it gave the best sound quality. My radio didn't have a line in jack. If it did, that would have been even better, but mine didn't. So it was like, okay, we'll hijack the antenna stream. So yeah, that's pretty cool. And and there are some of these for about 50 bucks. Um, you get Bluetooth and you know everything else that, that you would want. So it's pretty good. I like this. Yeah. And really not that difficult. The hardest part is getting to the back of your car radio. Sometimes on some cars, that's super easy. You don't even have to like unscrew anything. You just sort of climb under and, uh, you know, under like the, the dash or whatever. And it, it's right there. And other times it's not. But, you know, thankfully now, unlike when I was in high school, you have YouTube. So you can check your car and someone will tell you how to do it and show you how it's done, which is even better. Thoughts on that one, Mr. Braun? Moving on. Moving on. Keith, for the same question, says, um, he says, without knowing the make and model, uh, it's impossible to suggest something specific. However, my old car radio uh, is without Bluetooth, and I bought uh, something called, it's it's from a company called Anycar at anycarlink.com, A-N-Y-C-A-R-L-I-N-K.com, and they have them for every different model of car. He says it connects to the CD changer socket on the back of the radio, which is a functional socket, unlike a line in jack where it just provides audio. This one, um, it can take the audio, but it can also allow you to use the controls on the radio or the steering wheel. So if your car has a CD in jack and you have these controls on the steering wheel, this any car link device will translate those over Bluetooth to your phone. So you can change, cha you know, change tracks and do all of that cool stuff. So you, that that's definitely worth checking out at anycarlink.com. Uh, really cool solution that, that, you know, if your car has a CD player, which most cars, you know, sold in the last, whatever, I don't know, 10, 15 years do uh, that might allow you to, to kind of jack into that too. So pretty good. Pretty good. Nice. Yeah, I know. All right. Uh, let's see. Bruce, what were we talking about? Oh, yeah. In uh, in the last episode, actually, we were talking about a couple of different things. He says, uh, Bruce says, in 756, uh, somebody wrote in asking about the various names that might be assigned to a given Mac. There's a utility at whatroute.net called System Name uh, for finding out and editing all of the various names for your Mac. Very cool. I agree. That's pretty good. Uh, he says also in terms of uh, monitoring what's happening with your Wi-Fi signal in real time, there's an app from Adrian Granados who uh, makes the other makes Wi-Fi Explorer, which we mentioned in the last episode. This other app is called Wi-Fi Signal, uh, which he says for five bucks is an excellent menu utility for displaying everything you, Dave in particular, he says, <laughs> well, I think we both want to know about our Wi-Fi connections. He says uh, it alerts you via a notification when your Mac switches to a different base station or a network or even a, a, a different access point, even if it's the same network. So if you're roaming with mesh, you, you can be alerted to all of that. That might actually be really helpful for you, John, with, uh, you know, your bathroom testing and, and all of that stuff. So, yeah, that's pretty cool. Thank you, Bruce. So, yep, this is why we do these cool stuff found fun little utilities. Uh, anything on either of those, John, before we move on to the next one that comes out of 756? No, oh, I'm going to have to download all this stuff. I know. Yeah. No. Thankfully, most of this. Well, actually, no, one of them's free. One of them's not. But that's OK. You know, we want to support these developers if, uh, if we wind up using it. Uh, Gary writes, <laughs> you might like this, John. He says uh, in the last show, you were talking about Verizon's call filter and AT&T's call protect. He says there's another app uh, that was recommended to me and it has top status on its various app stores. When you search for these type of call blocking apps, he says this app is called Robo Killer and it blocks known spam callers uh, and so forth, similar to Nomo Robo. But the difference is that this one gives you the option to scam the scammer. Once you install the app, 
You have to activate it on your phone by placing a one-time call to its dedicated number. The call will play a recorded message telling you that all the calls in its database will be forwarded to this number. The app has a feature called answer bots uh, that you can use and choose the type of answer bots that you want used. He says, I just have mine set to random. They give you a disclosure saying that you are responsible for the results. But if it means that you don't get the call, but the robot does, I think it's worth it. He says the app's not free. However, you have to pay either three bucks a month or 25 bucks a year. And it is constantly updated, including the database, of course. Uh, and he says the app works with carriers who support the select forward and uh, Verizon and AT&T and it, it, most of the others do. If it, I think it's the same feature that like you would use if you wanted to have Google voice answering your calls. It's you, you type in like a you know, a thing into your phone. It's like a star, star, whatever code. And then it does the select forwarding or whatever, but that's pretty cool. I like having, you know, a robot that answers the phone and, and maybe takes the, the scammer down a path. That's pretty good. I like that. You might have to sign up for that, John. This might, this might bring you great joy. It might be that 25 bucks a year might be the, the most joyous 25 bucks you spend. Yeah. I like the current offering, man. These guys are persistent. It's like, yeah, one day it flagged like a whole bunch. Uh, I mean, there was one, they like called and no answer. And then they called like, like, you know, an hour later and it's like, stop. Yeah. So I yeah. just highlight and say, put it on my block list. And then I don't hear from them. Again. Then you're good to go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, listener Joe hipped us to a device called the touchy base. Uh, it's on Kickstarter. So all the, Kickstarter disclaimers apply. You are essentially, you know, a, a, a venture capitalist funding this thing and it may or may not ever see the light of day, but it looks cool enough that it's worth mentioning. We ignore a lot of the Kickstarter things here, but this one's cool. So it's called the touchy base T O Q I touchy, right? Base. And uh, it's a desk lamp. Uh, it could be a night stand lamp with several chi plat, uh, 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 contacts on it, several chi coils on it. And you can put your phone on there. You can put your watch on there. Um, it's got a USB uh, power out the back, both for chi and uh, sorry for USB C and USB a uh, it's got an AirPods dock for your AirPods um, uh, charging case, right? So you drop it in, it's got the little lightning connector, you drop it in, you're good to go. So this is pretty cool. Uh, you know, and the watch can, can be, you can do it flat or it can kind of sit up so you can see it like, uh, you know, like the, like your, in whatever they call it, nightstand mode. There you go. Uh, so yeah, pretty cool. And I think you can back it for 69 bucks now to get, to get one of these maybe in July, if it, you know, if it, if it succeeds, but I think it's, does it hit its goal? Yeah. Yeah. They had a $5,000 goal and they're at 10 grand. So it, this will fund. So bear that in mind while you, uh, while you do this. So pretty good. Thanks for that, Joe. Fun stuff. I hope, I hope this one makes it. I don't know if I'm going to back it or not, um, but I like the idea. It's good. Thoughts on that, John, before we move on to James. No, it's a nice combo. I, I remember yeah. seeing something similar at CES. It was, yeah, a lamp and a charger and, mm -hmm. and did some other things too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's pretty sense. cool. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, a couple more cool stuff found here. A few more, actually. James uh, hipped us to something called page turn for iOS. Uh, and he says, Dave, I thought you may, may be interested in this because it lets you turn pages in sheet music or documents. Doesn't have to be sheet music, but it can be uh, with facial gestures. And it uses the true depth camera on the iPhone 10 and, and, you know, 10 series iPhone. So all of them, the 10 R, the 10 S, 10 S max, et cetera. And also of course on the 2018 iPad pro, uh, which is the same tech that lets face ID and Memoji work. So if you've got face ID, you can use this app uh, and it watches your expression and you can like wink, or I think you can set what you want the, uh, the expression to be. I've, I haven't tried this app, but I've played games with it where you like you raise your eyebrow, uh, you know, your left eyebrow, or your right eyebrow or whatever to, you know, to play a game and like move something around on the screen. And it's pretty flawless. Like it, the detection is pretty good how quick it it works. And, and it's certainly doable. So I could see this being being functional uh, in a in a meaningful way. It's pretty cool, huh, John? Me? Yeah, you're the John. <laughs> You're the only one I get to talk to, like, and get responses back from while we do this. 
right? Pretty cool. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I spoke for the Chicago, uh, the greater Chicago. I actually don't even know where I spoke yesterday. I mean, I sort of do, but uh, Dave Ginsburg, who uh, is in the chat room and we mentioned earlier, cause he had the right answer for us. Um, he, he organizes his group there. I spoke there yesterday morning, Saturday morning, I should say. And uh, and while we were talking, uh, as as I got going, I talked about Wi-Fi, but he said you might want to know about presenter mode in Pages for iPad that has auto scroll, so you can have a document in Pages, and you go to the three little dots, uh, I think in the corner, and you can turn on presenter mode and check the box that says auto scroll, and you can set the speed too. And it essentially turns your iPad into a makeshift teleprompter where, you know, you just got to, you've got to get the pacing right and obviously practice with that or whatever. But, uh, but yeah, what a, what a cool thing. So that's why it's a cool thing. It's cool stuff found. There you go. And then there were, there were two others. There was one that I came across for myself again. Uh, I spoke earlier in the week down in Princeton, New Jersey for their Mac user group. And um, spoke about backups for them and was reminded as I was preparing and talking with them about something from Somazone called Backup Loop, L-O-U-P-E. Time Machine is great. It can be great. It can also be kind of a pain in the neck, but it's a, it's a good part. It's a good thing to have in your backup stack. Uh, but sometimes it can be mysterious. You don't necessarily know what it is backing up or certainly what it has backed up. And sometimes you might see that, oh, it's backing up three gigs of data. And it's like, what in the last hour changed that I have three gigs of data to back up? Backup loop shows you the contents of each individual backup that you have in your time machine library. So you can see what things were backed up at each interval. And that can be really handy uh, from a troubleshooting standpoint, if you're trying to figure out what, you know, what three gigabyte thing is getting backed up every single hour and it might be some log file that's just being touched once or something and it has grown big or you know, whatever, but it's super handy to be able to dig in. And uh, so backup loop will do that for you. And it works with Mojave. I've tested it. Uh, I, and it, this is definitely a cool stuff found reprise because we've talked about backup loop in the past, but I think it's been a good long while. So pretty good, huh, John? Yeah, I just started revisiting it myself. Yeah, I had something similar. It was like, why are you backing up to 300 gigabytes? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which it was doing. I, well, <laughs> yes, I I actually couldn't use backup loop to solve my problem because I I couldn't complete my first time machine backup on my machine in the office. It was uh, it, like so I can't see the contents, but it was telling me it had to back up way more than I was throwing at it. Well, it turns out the next thing on the cool stuff found list did help me uh, clean my Mac 10 or clean my Mac X, whatever you like to call it, added a new feature this week called Space Lens, which is um, a, a new way of looking at all of the storage being used on your device. And we've talked about other apps like Daisy Disk and, and Clean My Mac has had a similar functionality, but Space Lens is new, um, a new way of looking at it. Omni Disk Sweeper is another one. But as we've talked about, like Omni Disk Sweeper and, and even Daisy Disk weren't finding these things because uh, Omni Disk Sweeper is sort of weird to run in administrator mode and um, Daisy Disk, I don't know why wasn't finding this, but Space Lens did. Um, and it found that I had some files in private var DB that were like 500 gigs. Now, my SSD in my iMac in the office is only 500 gigs. So I knew they weren't really, it wasn't really 500 gigs, but it was a, I think a sparse bundle or, or something that could grow up to a maximum of 500 gigs. So it reports to the file system is 500, but it's not actually taking up that much space. This new thing in uh, the space lens in clean my Mac 10 did find it, which was helpful because that was the problem with my time machine backups. And it was I'll put a link to this. It was um, files that started with ATPS. And I think it was the Acronis backup software. It Acronis is true image and their active protection. They do things like to protect you against um, uh, uh, ransomware where your drive gets encrypted or whatever. They save this stuff in a way that that you could restore but 
it um, for whatever reason, it tricks the file system. So if you want to use a Cronus true image, you just tell time machine, don't back up that folder. And, and then you're good to go. I, I haven't been using it on that particular Mac. So I just took it off, but, uh, and remove the files, but, um, but yeah, this, uh, I'm, I'm liking space lens. It scanned the drive really quickly and you can look in, you know, kind of a typical uh, list view sorted by what's taking up the most space, but you can also, it has like this bubble lens view where it shows things, you know, proportion to their, mm. to their sizes. Yeah. Yeah, so if you got clean my Mac 10, you're already good to go. So, yeah, I got it. And uh, actually, I just ran it and uh, I got a little alert saying, hey, here's what's new. And also, it says setup in that window. So, I guess it's part of setup. And clean my Mac. Well, it's made by the same people that make Mac Paw, make yeah, yeah, yeah. setup and clean my Mac. So, yeah, clean my Mac is part of setup. That's right. Yep. Oh. Which is handy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It All is right. good. All right. We have some, we have some questions. I want to get to the, uh, let's circle back to Chris and Andrew, and then we'll do two Andrews in a row is what we're going to do here. So we'll start with Chris. Um, Chris writes, uh, my existing Macs are old says I have a 2010 MacBook Pro that's on its last legs. He says I've already replaced its workload with a 10 and a half inch iPad Pro. My wife's 2011 iMac died uh, recently because of the graphics card. Uh, so I migrated all of our important items, documents, most importantly, and a fully downloaded photos library to what was our kids Mac mini that we had connected to a TV on our playroom. We have one. We have more than one iOS device per person. Uh, with a two terabyte iCloud storage plan for all of our documents, but uh, everyone's and, and documents, photos, and videos it says with a 13 year old daughter who has a larger photo library than mine or my wife's keeping those safe is a major concern. Ultimately, this Mac mini is having issues as well. I have four user accounts on it uh, and moving between them is excruciatingly glacier like not to mention about a third of the time when I log into my account, I go into a cycle where I get a black blank screen and about 30 or 45 minutes later, the login screen appears as though nothing has happened. I know the hard drive is a major bottleneck on the system, but I decided I don't want to put any additional money into this computer when instead I could upgrade to a newer Mac mini. My wife uh, used used to use her iMac more frequently, but uh, now she has a school Chromebook and she mostly uses that at home. She says, I almost bought a new MacBook Air, but I can only afford currently to by replace one computer. And I really want a hub for all of our cloud items to live physically in our home and then get backed up locally and backblaze and all that. So I've settled on a new Mac mini, but based on prices, I think I'm going to go with the entry level machine. I currently have my wife's photo library on the internal hard drive of my mini plus mine uh, on my daughter's external SSD. So here are my questions. Migration assistant. My first thought is set up from scratch and use target disk mode to drag over the necessary files. How can I move the existing external SSD to the new computer without having to jump through too many hoops? Downloading multiple photos libraries from the cloud is problematic due to my Xfinity data cap. Um, what should go on to the new internal SSD, which will likely be 128 gig and what's best for the external drive? Uh, he says, and, and if I really stretched, I could afford the six core version of this, but is that really going to make a difference other than the fact that uh the doubled internal SSD would likely keep me from needing a new external up front. And lastly, my wife and I both, you have Apple watches. Does the unlock feature work on multiple user accounts? So I'll start with that one because that's the easy one. Yes. Watch unlock is a user account setting. So yeah, you can unlock your user and she'll be able to unlock hers going. Um, I'm actually going to keep going backwards on this, John, because I think talking about which machine to get is the right one uh, next and looking, I, you know, I, you asked about performance. Um, I looked in Mac tracker, which is great because it has uh, performance scores from Geekbench in there. Uh, and you turned me on to that, Mr. Braun. That's a, it's a great resource having everything right there. We love Mac tracker. Um, looking at that, you know, the high end CPU, which is in the 1299 uh, Mac mini is almost twice as fast as the entry level CPU in uh, in there. Will it make a difference? So eventually, yeah, 
I think so. From a longevity standpoint, uh, I think you will hit a point down the road where that, you know, uh, that I three that's slower and less cores will max out before you, um, you know, before, before the, the faster, I think, which is an I nine or an I eight. I can't remember which, which model it is, but, um, but anyway, Oh, it's an eighth gen I nine, I think is what it is. But, uh, but yeah, I, I think so. I, I, I think it'll make a difference again, down the road, out of the gate. Probably not. It's going to be, whatever you get, it's going to be way faster than what you currently have. And we'll run everything you need. But, you know, depending on how long you plan to keep this machine, you tend to keep things for a little while. This may make a difference down the road. And the CPU is the one thing that no matter how willing you are to rip that thing apart, you are not going to change. So um, so that is that is a permanent decision, at least for this machine. Did you have any thoughts on that, John, or feel differently or go? go. Um. But I think they're all fast enough, as you pointed out. Yeah, yeah, right, right. But but if if you were advising him, which as it turns out, we are. Well, what would you what would you advise? So it's an i seven on the top end. It's an i three on the bottom end, and i seven on the top end. Again, compared to my current machine, which uh, I mean, it depends on if you're doing something that w- requires what I call heavy lifting. You can tell that that's happening if you uh, get a tool, which I think we're going to talk about that shortly. Um, but, you know, look at what you do day to day and see if uh, any of these benchmarking tools show that you are consuming a lot of any particular resource, whether it be CPU or GPU or, or things like that. Right. Uh, I mean, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's because uh, I see two classes of users. One, you know, power user, you know, like people that do Photoshop or, you know, video editing and, and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I, I don't think that's them, but, y- you know, it. But, it, but again, like I find, you know, I have a, a 2011 IMAX still running in the house, I think. No, no, no. I have, it's either a 2007 or 2008 running in the house. It has plenty of Ram, uh, it plenty of storage, but the CPU is the thing that, you know, it is pegged all of the time. That wasn't the case when I bought it, right? It, like when I, when oh. I bought it, it was totally fine because the OS was, you know, not maxing out the CPU. In fact, when I bought it, the drive was the slow thing, right? It has an SS there. Now, now I've upgraded it to an SSD. So the drive bottleneck is gone. Um, but even when I did the SSD upgrade, like the CPU wasn't pegged all the time. Now it is. If I, if it had a faster CPU in it, that machine would be more usable today um, no, I don't, I think I got it with the fastest CPU then. I mean, it, you know, the machine's 12 years old or something. So like, it doesn't owe me anything, but, um, but I, that's why I think, you know, if, it, if you are someone that keeps your machines for a long time, I think buying the, the fastest CPU that you can afford out of the gate because it's not replaceable, it's not upgradable down the road. That, that, that's where, that's sort of where my thought process goes to. You can do RAM on the new Mac mini on your own. Uh, it's about a 20 minute tour in and out. If you're comfortable with that sort of thing, so that you're not paying Apple's huh. RAM prices. So, and then of course, you know, the SSD, it's got Thunderbolt ports on the back, so you can do whatever you want with it. It's also got USB a ports on the back, which is great. You've got both, um, you know, and so you can expand that with high speed drives and you're good to go. So I wouldn't worry about, worry mm-hmm. about that, but yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. Where are we here? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so while we're, oh, we have to, we, we're still on Chris here. Um, in terms of what to put on the internal drive versus external drives, I would put Mac OS, obviously, you're, you're going to boot from that internal drive. Although there's an argument to be made for booting from the external Um but I would I, I think I think even with the 128 gig drive, you can put Mac OS and your, you know, generic user accounts and documents. It's it's you can have your user accounts uh, external, but man, like that's a headache. But I, I would not 
put iTunes or photos on that internal drive. I would, I would continue to use, you know, external drive for photos. And I would also move your iTunes library. The nice part about both of those libraries is you can relocate them to an external drive in a way that is fully supported by Apple. You can do it right inside the app. So you're not, you know, jury rigging something in a way that that's going to bite you down the road. Like this is fully supported. It's time honored tradition. It's all good. Um, but I think, you know, depending on what your how big your documents folders are, you pro probably are OK. Um, if you're not, you certainly can offload documents to an external drive or you said you use iCloud storage. So you could click that optimized storage on your Mac button and it will only download the documents that you want. But to your point, I think you want this to have everything. So maybe the documents wind up being on an external drive if you've got big stuff. You know, if you're working on, you know, if you're creating family movies and things like that, you might want to you know, put those projects external, but it, it, thoughts on that, Mr. Braun, before we talk about where, to, how to migrate his stuff. Uh, let's go. So your photos libraries, you talked about wanting to have, uh, you have them on the external drive with your current machine and how to get those on the new machine without re-downloading everything. The, you, there's really good news here. Because those photos libraries are entirely self-contained uh, wherever they are stored. So if they are stored on the external drive, this is the best case scenario for you. You will take that external drive, you will plug it into the new Mac, and then you will go into photos and you will tell photos, I want to use, actually, really the best thing to do is launch photos with the option key held down and choose a photos library. It, you can have multiple photos libraries going simultaneously. And you will just point it at the one on the external drive and you're done. Like it shouldn't need to download anything because that library is self-contained and that library knows that it already has everything from the cloud. So this, this should be a very, very quick process for you. It, it might do a little bit of resyncing, but even that resyncing doesn't move a lot of data back and forth, even though it says it does, it, it really doesn't, but it, I don't even think you'll run into that. You should be okay. Um, which leads us to the first and now final question, migration assistant or manual. Um, you know, either option is going to be fine. Migration assistant um, is certainly going to be simpler in the short term because it gets you up and running and all your settings and everything are exactly like you had. But, you know, that's an old machine, which means you probably haven't started from scratch in a good long time. It's really not that difficult to do the manual migration. Uh, if you are able to have the old machine up and running for a little while, while you have, you know, this new one, uh, then, you know, that's not so bad to, to move things back and forth. I, 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 I would, I, I say this, um, but you know, I know how time constraints are certainly I would do it as a new, you know, a new, uh, new setup and then just manually migrate, but. You're not, I don't think you're going to hate yourself if you do migration assistant either. What do you think, John? I'm a big fan of it. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. It works really, really well. It's crazy, but you know, works. All right. Uh, moving on to Andrew. Yes, John. Uh, yes. Cool. So Andrew writes, he says, I just purchased a similar vein here, a, a 2017 MacBook air. At most, he says, I'll be using it for school assignments and some basic web design stuff, developing WordPress, Joomla, Pres Pres Presta shop sites. He says, what are the programs that you two would consider essential for a new Mac? I'm not totally new to the Mac because I've owned a couple, but I'm far more used to Windows. Okay, so it is going to be almost impossible for John and I to limit our lists of things that we can't live without. But we definitely want your feedback on this, too. So. Uh, so John, why don't, why don't you start and list, list your, I don't know, top three or four, and then I'll, I'll list top three or four, and then we'll probably want to add a couple more to the list because you know, we're, we're geeks, but can't okay. live without not, not would be nice to have, but I, I would say let's, let's go for can't live without apps. Okay. And, and that's what I'm going to give you here. Cool. So I stat menus. Okay. Hardware growler. Dubuki tools and fruit juice. 
this is fascinating. Okay. I, I love this. I, I, I mean, if everybody that has listened long enough knows that you and I approach things very, very differently. And like, there's a theme to your can't live without apps. These are, I need to know what my system is doing. Um, and I would anticipate what if something starts going wrong? What if the machine is not doing what I want? Sure. All of these tools to varying degrees will do that for you. Yep. They, no, it's totally true. These are your, you know, real time diagnostic tools. If, uh, if you will, for sure. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I have my own list. Uh, we had one thing in common and that was iStat menus because I like to see what's going on for sure. Um, but my list is, well, is going to, is going to betray my priorities here. Keyboard might, and this is not in any particular order. I wouldn't necessarily put keyboard maestro first, but, but it, they're all sort of equally can't live without keyboard maestro text expander default folder, uh, mail act on, and I'm going to cheat. And, and go to a fifth one bartender, which we've actually already mentioned in the show because you were saying you needed it. Um, so these mine are clearly all about productivity and automation and making things happen faster. Um, and without these things, especially I could probably I could live without bartender. Um, but the other ones here, like I, I, I equate it to typing with mittens on. Like I, I would feel so slowed down if I didn't have all of these things. Keyboard Maestro keeps my life in order. Um, you know, with uh, it's the future of automation on the Mac, right? Text Expander. I'm, I like Text Expander. I probably could do eighty percent of what I want to do in Text Expander with Keyboard Maestro, but I, but not a hundred. So there you go. Default folder. I, like it. Mac OS has some functionality like this built in, but open save dialogues and being able to move around with default folder makes life way easier. And then mail act on I'm totally addicted to for the way I can file mail very quickly with it. Probably not quite as universal uh, in its, in its usefulness or appeal, but certainly for me, I live in email all day long and, and it, I, I get to not take my hands off the keyboard and still file mail exactly where I want and do things that I want with it which is you know that's what it's that's what it's there for so any do you have any any one thing to add john we want to hear from you folks for sure but uh but you know yeah there you go uh i got like a secondary list but you uh, the, the, there's like 10 things on it so, okay um, all right well, okay let me, let me look at um you know I'll, I'll throw one more out here yeah go ahead um, please it's kind of a productivity thing um and it's typically something i install on a new machine uh app cleaner oh yeah oh that reminds me of hazel app Apple yeah. doesn't do a good a good job of getting rid of all of the parts of an application now yes you can throw an application away sure but that doesn't that typically does not get rid of the support libraries and all the, the stuff buried in your system and you don't want to leave that around maybe not so much for uh space reasons but you don't want these low level modules start fighting and, and screwing things up. And we've seen that happen a lot. Totally. Uh, so something like that and Hazel does, does something similar, Yeah. but it, it's smart enough to say, okay, well you want to get rid of the app. Um, and it actually proactively comes up and says, Oh yeah, by the way, um, you, you want to get rid of all these other things that I think that, that, that I, I'm pretty sure this app. Yeah. Long to this app as well. And I'm like, yep. So help to keep your system running stable and clean. Yeah, it does. Um, I would point out, I use Hazel. It, it has that functionality in it, but I use it as part of my automation workflow because it does like watched folders and, and things like that, which is awesome. Uh, in the chat room, though, Mac Vader points out that clean my Mac 10 also has a fun a, 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 a bit of functionality that will uh remove you know do your app cleaning for you and honestly it's probably better than either of the ones that we've mentioned because um, hazel will do it automatically like it watches what you're doing and will offer but to my knowledge once it has offered whether you accept or decline you cannot go back and say i want to do that again app cleaner doesn't do it in an automated way but you can say go and like do this clean my mac 10 does both 
And so you can see a list of apps that it thinks you should clean junk from. Um, and it will actually, you know, kind of keep that up to date. But when you when you throw an app away, it will also prompt you, hey, do you want to like clean this stuff up or not? You know, so, yeah, good stuff. All right. Well, we'll 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 stop this segment there. Um, but I would uh, I would definitely want to, you know, inc- please encourage you to to do this. Dan, I will throw out Dan says um, uh a clipboard manager and that is perhaps why keyboard maestro lives at the top of my list because yes it's the future of automation on the mac but it also has a clipboard manager in it like once you live with a clipboard history of some sort there is no going back because i will just throw things on my clipboard uh, and then go like, you know, I'll be in a web page. I'll, I'll copy the URL, maybe the title and some things about it. And then, you know, replying to you folks or whatever. It's like, oh, OK, I want to now I want to link you to this and do this and do that. And I don't have to worry about it because I know it's all in my clipboard history and I can just choose which ones I want and paste them in. And so, yeah, 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 it's good. K- clipboard manager by like if you don't have one of those, start using one and then you will never be able to go back. But it's it's a like it's a good place to be. Yeah. Yeah. You want to yeah. take us to the I app? Go ahead. Uh, I will, but App Cleaner does have a smart mode where oh. people throw something in the trash, it pops in. They call it Smart Delete. Oh, uh, I had no idea. Uh, very yeah, good. they they didn't use to. The, the, at some point, they added it, and I was like, "Wow, that's really clever." Oh, that's so, good. Um, and I believe it's free, though. You can certainly throw some money. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. The developer, which uh, I think I have in the past. Cool. Yeah, let's go to uh, the other Andrew because go. um, yeah. good one. I think. Pretty quick here, and I think this this one uh, is interesting and applicable. Um, and actually, you will see that uh, I posted a follow up. But the original note from Andrew was as follows: I have a late 2013 MacBook Pro, which I absolutely love. Mama, don't take my USB ports, SD card slot, and full size HDMI port away. Sorry for the Simon Garfunkel aside, but those are some of the reasons why I'm holding on to this one, and I would concur with my machine as well. But to continue, when running Onyx recently, it told me that I needed to repair the drive, a one terabyte original Apple SSD. This has happened before, and in that case, I booted from an external drive, then went into disk utility and was able to choose the laptop's drive and run disk repair. This time, the repair repeatedly fails. Do you have any other suggestions for me? Maybe using another utility. Also, I can't boot into recovery mode. My Mac thinks I want to reinstall the OS after I restart and hold down Command R. Any suggestions for that? All right. So a few things here. So, yeah, um, I won't go into detail about my mid 2012 15 inch MacBook Pro, which I love to death. Um, you guys can get all your for- ports, though. You can get all your ports with a with a Thunderbolt know, hub. It really like yes, it, it's a I I really like this new like hub world because I can just add. Oh, no, I know I, I can. Want. Just, yeah. Yeah. It's just that I have to, you know, get a dock or, or cables or uh, yeah. new, st- uh, you know, I have new, to find stuff. new stuff. Correct. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But that's the price of progress, I guess. All right. 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 Yeah, exactly. So as far as macOS recovery, first, I found that it can be very picky regarding the timing of holding down Command R. And Apple actually suggests in their article called macOS recovery, they say what you should do is turn on your machine and then hold down Command R. I'm going to tell you the right way to do it. How about holding down Command R first and then hitting the power button? Oh, does that work? So, well, uh, we'll, we'll follow up in a moment on that. Okay. But that was my one suggestion. So second, while normally you should be able to boot from the recovery partition, unless it's screwed up or something, guess what? Um, you can actually load a version of recovery from the internet, Dave. I, I kind of knew this. I, I, I don't think I've ever tried it. Yeah. The key combination is slightly different. It's option command R or shift option command R. Now, what happens is when you start up, uh, if the machine is connected to a network, then it will you'll see a little spinning globe and it'll start downloading recovery from the Internet. Isn't that neat? <laughs> um, and if it's a, a Wi-Fi, then it'll ask you to connect to your Wi-Fi network and then it'll download it over that. And it didn't take too long for me, like you know, maybe three, three minutes. Sure. And then all of a sudden you get the same recovery. So. Keep in mind that you can download recovery from the Internet and. And and then it's it's the same old thing. Huh. All right. I don't. Yeah, I like I, it. I don't know that I knew that. That's interesting. Huh. 
Cool. Yeah. So keep in mind if you can't. Uh, uh, as for disk repair, as far as I can tell, this utility is just running a version. I think it's APFS underscore FSCK, which is the Unix utility for fixing drives. Um, and I don't think it's very thorough. I'll just throw out one suggestion, um, although I haven't really used it in a while, but I hear Disk Warrior um, is a better tool for repairing damage. Yeah, it's tough with APFS now, right? Because we don't have decades of history that uh, these third party utilities can use to, you know, build some functionality there. So, yeah, it I'm like, yeah, I don't know the like there's not much that can do it like like, you know, some of these third party utilities drive genius at some level uh, disc warrior at a better level uh, can repair APFS volumes. But, uh, you know, I, this is why backups are important, because the our our knowledge of what problems look like is a far more limited sample set right now with APFS than it is with HFS plus. And because of that, the repair options are also, you know, far more constrained and limited with APFS. So there might be scenarios where the, you know, the only way to fix it is to wipe the drive and restore it from a clone. Thankfully, cloning and all of that is is fairly easy and commonplace now. So, you know, you should always have a clone. That's my advice. And and if worse comes to worse, you update your clone, you wipe the drive and, uh, you know, restore from the clone. You're good to go. So, yeah. And the follow up for Andrew was that my suggestion to change the sequence of where you hold things down. Did it exactly did exactly what he wanted. Yeah, he was able to run it. There was a minor. There was a minor, uh, let's see, it was invalid volume free block count. Oh. And it fixed that. So apparently having that free block count off caused the machine to think that you were wanting to reinstall the OS, which is kind of wacky. Yep. Haven't heard it before. Huh. Huh. So um so it was able it was able to repair the damage. So I'm I'm which is great. I'm curious about this sequence thing because I have I, I and I feel like this is just an experiential thing. So I, I may be entirely wrong on this, certainly, you know, with newer Max. But I thought any keys that were held down prior to startup would be like, ignored by Mac OS as, you know, as the system was starting up. I thought you had to push them down like maybe right after you hit the power button. But. I thought it was, I thought there was something in there where, you know, I always wait till the chime. And as soon as I hear the chimes even begin, now I know, okay, I can, I can hit my magic buttons, but have you tried it with the, um, Oh yeah. It, with yeah, it, it down fun. before you turn it on. It does work. Okay. That's good. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. Good. The thing, the, the, the problem is that again, their advice to first power up, wait for the chime and then hold it down. I think what happens with a lot of people is that if you hold it down, even a millisecond after the chime ends, it's not going to see it. It's not going to see it. That's right. Yeah. Right. When you hear the chime and the chime, if you even get a chime, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Which could. Yes, exactly. Yep. Yeah. Because your, your new, newer machines don't, the newer portables don't, uh, I forgot when they stopped doing it, but they, they don't chime anymore, right? That is correct. Yeah. Honestly, I don't even notice it anymore, but yes, that is correct. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Cool. All right. Well, um, you know, there is one thing that I want to share. It's a quick one. I promise. And I know we're already past where we would be, um, be leaving the show. So I will, I will get right to it. Um, because it's something I didn't know about. And I think is, is something really handy. TJ, uh, replied to something we were talking about in the last episode. We, uh, and actually I've been talking about it for several episodes and I kind of want to put this to bed where uh, I, it started with me talking about how I keep a landline so that a phone can ring in the, in the house at night, even if do not disturb is on, even if the mute switch is on. And we talked about how, you know, even if you set people to, you know, in your favorites list or whatever, and they can bypass your do not disturb with the mute switch on, you know, your phone's not going to make a noise. TJ points out that that is, can be an incorrect statement. He says, um, go to a contact, edit the contact. This is on your iPhone. 
and tap on ringtone. You know, you can set custom ringtones for a contact. And there is an option there for emergency bypass. The fine print says emergency bypass allows sounds and vibrations from this person, even with do not disturb, um, even when do not disturb is on. But in his experience, it also overrides the mute switch. And you can do the same thing for text tone if you want to bypass uh, this stuff for text messages, too. Now, with great power comes great responsibility because it means that even when you hit your mute switch, when you say go into a meeting or a movie or, you know, a, you know, a presentation that your boss is giving, uh, your phone will make a noise if this person calls or if you turn it off for texting or turn it, turn emergency bypass on for texting. Also them, too. But it is good to know that this is there. So bear this in mind. Emergency bypass on iOS. And uh, that that's all I have to say about that. Do you have anything to say about that before we uh, before we move on here, John? And by move on, I mean, you no. know, I mean, I typically have my I almost always have mine on mute. Right. Oh, same. Yeah. And so this would bypass that. I, I, I really feel like you should turn it on for me so you can always hear when I'm calling you. That, that would, you know, there you go. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> Yep. All right. Well, we broke the hour and a half mark with this episode, but that's OK. Uh, we had lots to talk about and really we have lots more to talk about. We could we could end this show and record the next one. It's awesome. You folks send in so much great stuff, not just great questions, but obviously great tips and you know, great cool stuff found. You're, I love that not only are you listening, but, you know, you're replying and engaging and like it's it's a conversation that we're having here during the show it's a conversation that john and i are having with actually and also with the folks in the chat room at macgeekab.com slash stream but all week it's a conversation that we're all having you can join in the conversation if you want to be a little more interactive uh at our forums at macgeekab.com slash forums uh you can uh if you're a premium subscriber you can email us at premium at macgeekab.com of course you can learn more about that at macgeekab.com slash premium uh, so thank you to everybody. It's really it's so awesome. Um, thanks to Cashfly for providing the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. Um, this week I'm going to thank Amazon for you know having Amazon Prime and me being able to order something, i.e. a new mixer at 5 o'clock p.m. on Thursday and have it arrive at 10 a.m. on Saturday. That was pretty good. Very thankful for that. <laughs> thankful for our sponsors, as we mentioned in the show. Of course, uh, we have Malwarebytes at Malwarebytes.com slash Mac. Uh, in the podcast marketplace, of course, we have Smile at smilesoftware.com slash podcast. We have Otherworld Computing at maxsales.com, barebones software at barebones.com, Eero at Eero.com slash MGG. And we've got some more coming too. It's fun stuff. I love it. <sighs> Thanks, John. This was a fun one. Thanks, everybody, for listening. You brought us into this mess. 757, another airplane episode. What uh, what do you have to say for yourself? Anything to share? I got nothing. Well, no, I have one. No, I have two. Uh, I have three things for you, Dave. And they are don't get caught. Made up.